chose Nadia. Because as she later revealed in an interview, it sounded exotic. She was finally introduced to Hindi films as a slave girl in Dej Deepa by Jamshed Wadia, the founder of Wadia Mobutu. She represented a profound shift in the way women were depicted in Indian cinema, usually as vamps, virgins, or victims, frequently portrayed as a woman fighting injustice. Fearless Nadia was certainly the precursor by several decades to the angry young man. How can we forget the gorgeous Devi Karani, who related to Rabindranath Tagore through her paternal grandmother, Sukumani Devi, which uh, I'm not entirely sure of, but that's what it says. Who was the Nobel laureate's sister, as it says, a popular star? She co-founded the iconic Bombay Talkies, along with her husband Himanshu Shurai in the year 1934, to produce around a hundred films. Initially assisting in costume design and art direction in Rai's experimental silent film, A Throw of Dice, she soon began appearing in lead roles. After Himanshu Shurai's death in 1940, David Garani single-handedly managed the studio, wading through several ownership battles to produce films like Basant and Kismet and launched the careers of prominent Indian film industry luminaries like Dilip Kumar who was introduced by her in 1944 in Jawar along with Ruma Thakurta, Guha Thakurta, Ruma Guha Thakurta, who later became Kishore Kumar's first wife. Then in 1945 she finally retired from the movie business after a tumultuous stint married the Russian painter Rorik and moved to lead a reclusive life in his estate in the outskirts. Back here. Here's another story related to Rabindranath Tagore about Shen. From the very beginning, ladies and gentlemen, cinema and its technical aspects had fascinated the point. In 1930, during his visit to the Soviet Union, he had watched Einstein's battleship potential visited film studios, interacted with directors and technicians, and in 1935 his biographer Edward Thompson had tried to negotiate with Hollywood's movie mogul Alexander Korda about the possibility of making films based on Tagore's works. Thompson suggested Chitrangada and Kshudita Pasha. Korda, however, turned down the offer as he was more interested in action-oriented films. Not many outside West Bengal know that Rabindranath Tagore did a director film based on his play Nati Puja, an ancient story of a dancer who sacrifices herself for her devotion to Lord Buddha. The metamorphosis of a court dancer from a woman of entertainment to a woman of spiritual dedication was extremely radical during those times. And being Sankara, being Sarsa, founder, proprietor of new theatres, invited Tagore to direct the movie. The performance exclusively consisted of female students from Santinikita, another first and perhaps the only Indian film with an all-woman cast. Released at Chitra Talkies on the 14th of March 1932, sadly the prince of the film were later reportedly destroyed in a fire. Looking back, the post-independence years undoubtedly brought many gifted women to the fore. Literature, Ismat Chukta, came to Bombay after marrying Shahid Latif. The foursome comprising Chukta, Latif, Sadat Hassan Manto, and S. Mukherjee had together worked on the screenplay of the super successful Kismet. Thereafter, Chukta formed a writer-director team with her husband and went on to work on the screenplays of various films. Besides Chukdai, Pratima Dasgupta, Zora Cycle rose to great heights in the 40s. Dasgupta's debut directorial venture, Chamiya, in the year 1945, was a path break. Bam! It is rumored by the then human Home Minister for its erotic content. After he had seen it, it is rumored nine times. Certainly, the period between the late 1920s and 40s firmly established the film industry as a viable career option. For women. In 1936, when there was a lot of talk about economic emancipation, freedom fighter, feminist, 
Now in 2019, ladies and gentlemen, there are no less than 1,500 to 2,000 registered women represented by various unions working behind the scenes in numerous departments for making big ticket movies. What started off as unusual career choice way back in 1926 has gradually become not just a coveted profession but also an exciting creative outlet. Today, more than a hundred years later, when women and men are toiling in the film industry shoulder to shoulder, we also have several options for viewing content in the comfort of our homes. Yet the thrill of watching movies on the big screen remains unmatched. We need to find ways to protect these traditions. I like the idea of pictures first showing in cinema halls and then perhaps going to streaming and other devices. I'm a loyalist to that degree. Yet, all said and done watching a film on the big screen must remain enticing and realistically priced. Content must be the undisputed king to draw people out of their sofas on lazy Sunday afternoons. Young viewers today have been exposed to international cinema, television and the arts. They want high quality entertainment, avenues to satisfy their evolved sensibilities. So we must pledge to give it to them with the same enthusiasm as our early pioneers. As Francis Ford Coppola had once said, I think cinema, movies and magic have always been closely associated. The very earliest people who made films were magicians. It is now our duty, ladies and gentlemen, not to let these magicians